Welcome back. Let's discuss the four most effective leaky gut treatments. Leaky gut may affect 25 up to 88% of those of us with symptoms, whether they be gastrointestinal, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, GERD, reflux, or systemic fatigue, headache, brain fog, joint pain, or just a feeling of generalized inflammation. Leaky gut may be at the core of 25 to 88% of these symptoms. So again, let's equip you with the four most effective strategies you can deploy to improve your leaky gut. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, providing practical science-based insights into health, exploring the importance of nutrition, lifestyle, and gut health through conversations with experts, research reviews, and personal stories. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. To set the stage here, let's start by defining what leaky gut is. If you went back 10 years ago, this was much more hotly contested. Oh, leaky gut's not a thing, there's no science. And some people were saying, well, there's some science. And now we have enough data to wherein we can conclude that yes, increased intestinal permeability, or the more colloquial way of saying it, leaky gut, is something that can implicate or be implicated in many syndromes, symptoms, conditions, and disease states. And I really appreciate this schematic from Frontiers in Immunology. What you're seeing here is the intestinal lumen. Specifically, important to bear in mind, this is the small intestine. Because remember, the small intestine is where 90% plus of calories and nutrition is absorbed. And that's where the leaky gut can occur because it's the selectively permeable membrane that has to be tightly regulated. And as this schematic is illustrating, when there's a disruption of microbial homeostasis, the bacteria, the fungus are imbalanced or overgrown, that can be one of a few different steps that leads to a disruption of the health of the barrier. And when this occurs, you see endotoxin or LPS leak through. So these are the actual particles or one of the particles. And the immune system responds with inflammation. And this is amongst a few, the TNF alpha and interleukin six that you're seeing here, which you'll see in the bloodstream. And you can also directly quantify the leaky gut with serum zonulin. And I sort of emphasize serum because we're learning that stool zonulin does not seem to be as accurate as blood or serum zonulin. So this is part of the picture of what's happening in your small intestine when leaky gut is present. And part of the tie-in here I want to make you aware of is really the inflammatory component. This might be how we reconcile seeing leaky gut correlate with both digestive symptoms, but also that list of systemic symptoms like brain fog, joint pain, and skin issues that we covered a moment ago. Let's go one step deeper and just make sure that we run through some of the most common causes of leaky gut, and then we'll parry that into the protocol of the four most effective things that you can do. By the way, thank you so much for watching the video. Please comment, like, or subscribe. I especially enjoy hearing what people think, what their questions are, future video ideas. So please make a comment. I'll do my best to respond to as many of those as I can. Okay, so coming over to some of the best documented causes of leaky gut, we touched on a moment ago this disruption of microbial homeostasis. Another way of saying that could be dysbiosis or overgrowth, as in SIBO. In addition to this, inflammation, as we also covered a moment ago, C-reactive protein, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, amongst a handful of inflammatory cytokines that can be causal to leaky gut. And leaky gut and inflammation are kind of a, a bidirectional entanglement. Gastrointestinal conditions, probably not surprising, but IBS, IBD, celiac, GERD, really any GI symptom throws up a flag that there could be leaky gut present. Additionally, probably not obvious, but worth just touching on, a Western diet, a high level of alcohol consumption. I'm not going to make the claim that any alcohol is going to be problematic. I think we can probably have a reasonable intake of even 
Western food, processed food, as long as it's not excessive. But too much bad food, too much alcohol, poor sleep, and chronic stress, all these factors start eroding at the health of this crucially important small intestinal membrane. Certain medications, antibiotics, NSAID, and anti-inflammatories, also chronic use of decongestants, as we've covered on the podcast in the past, and then chronic disease and aging, all can aggregate, coalesce to start weakening this barrier and leading to setting the stage four leaky gut. Okay, and we should also just echo the prevalence because there are some conditions that sound scary, yet may only impact 0.3% of the population. And it's not to take anything away from those, but if we understand prevalence, then we understand risk. Again, in those with symptoms, 25 to 88% of individuals have leaky gut, whereas only about 6% of healthy controls demonstrate leaky gut. So there's certainly a highly increased likelihood if you have symptoms, a condition, or a disease state that you could have leaky gut as a component underlying that. The first step of the four is diet. Now, I'm going to give you some specifics because I know when someone or a doctor says, just eat a healthier diet, it's quite lackluster. Okay, so specifically processed food. And here is a great schematic we adopted from the journal Foods 2022. You see a few emulsifiers. This might be one of the key factors. Emulsifiers and coloring agents, this carboxymethylcellulose, carrageenan, glycerol, monolaurate, polysorbitol, just to name a few, have been documented to lead to increases in leaky gut and also in inflammatory bowel disease. Because while on the one hand, yes, they will help to improve shelf life, these emulsifying agents, they also irritate and can start to break down the lining of your gut. Now, to be careful, it's not to say you can never have any processed food. We want to be careful to stave off this sort of pernicious gravity toward a somewhat pathological or unhealthy relationship with food. In moderation, won't be a problem. But if you're consuming processed food every day, a few times per day even, then this is when I would strongly encourage you to start making some changes because this might be the most foundational piece is the processed foods which actively can irritate and contribute to leaky gut. And that's what you're seeing portrayed here in a bit more of an involved schematic. But the take home is emulsifying agents amongst other ingredients and processed foods irritate the lining of the gut, contributing to leaky gut. Now, the flip side of this is consuming whole foods, which will be more nutrient dense, usually will have less calories or will be less prone to overeating, will contain phytonutrients, fiber, healthier proteins, healthier fats. So a simple thing you can do is just move from a diet that has more processed food over to a diet that's higher in whole, fresh, unprocessed foods. You may have heard this axiom of shopping the perimeter of the grocery store. This is where you'll have food that can spoil. And the interior will be your packaged foods that last longer on the shelf because of, in part, the emulsifying agents. And what's nice about this is it's dietarily agnostic. You can move from processed food to fresh whole food in any sort of diet plan, paleo, vegan, Mediterranean, high carb, low carb, or whatever you like. The other component here that you've likely heard of, but is worth mentioning, is a elimination and reintroduction of foods that are known to be irritating. The short list here, gluten, dairy, eggs, soy, fish, shellfish, nuts, and also perhaps seeds. Now, not all of these foods have been demonstrated to contribute to leaky gut, but they are known to, in some people, provocate symptoms. And I think symptoms is a pretty good proxy for leaky gut. But to be careful, we don't have data all the way down this list. Gluten has been shown to provocate leaky gut. Importantly, in the model of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, meaning you don't have full-blown diagnosable celiac, 
but there's still an aversion to gluten. However, we always have to balance this because if you look at the messaging online, oftentimes it will have people believe that anyone not feeling well, suspecting leaky gut, what have you, probably has a gluten intolerance. And when you look at the data on NCGS, non-celiac gluten sensitive, it averages at about 5% of the population. So something to consider cutting out and reintroducing, but the second half of that statement is really crucial. Reintroduce, because you don't want to be avoiding a food in perpetuity just based upon fear, based upon faith. And this is what's nice about many diet plans. I think the paleo diet is a good template to cut out most problematic foods for about a month and then reintroduce them and see when I bring back in bread, do I notice my symptoms clearly flare? When I bring back in dairy, do I notice I have loose bowels or abdominal pain? When I bring back in nuts or shellfish, do I notice I don't feel well you know, for whatever the reason? Because remember, leaky gut can manifest as gastrointestinal and systemic symptoms. So it's really not about the symptom specifically, but about the timing. I'm feeling good. I reintroduce. I feel poorly. I wait a week or two, I try again, now I'm feeling good again, reintroduce one more time, again, I elicit that same negative reaction. That's what you wanna look for so that you can be somewhat certain that a given food is causing a problem. And the other component to diet that I think is really underappreciated is low FODMAP dieting. This really speaks to the person who may have observed, sadly, the better I eat, the worse I feel. You'll see this sometimes, wherein someone improves their diet. They're eating less processed foods. They're eating more fruits and vegetables. Yet, their symptoms are getting worse. And sometimes what happens here is people are eating more fruits and vegetables, and many of these are high FODMAP. FODMAP stands for fermentable, oligodye, monosaccharides, and polyols. Structures of carbohydrate that we know are conducive to feeding intestinal bacteria. But the problem is, for some people, too much feeding occurs, thus flaring symptoms. Now, this is all conjecture until I show you some evidence. So let's look at this really impressive clinical trial where they found 12 weeks on a low FODMAP diet, reduced serum zonulin, blood zonulin, reduced lipopolysaccharide, the actual measure of stuff leaking through, and reduced interleukin-6, a inflammatory cytokine that usually accompanies the leakage. And the other point, without getting too into the weeds, I wanted to loop you in on, stool zonulin did not change. One of many, a growing data point showing us that uh, stool zonulin does not correlate with improvements in health but blood zonulin does. So just be careful because stool zonulin testing is fairly readily done. And just be careful because we're learning that doesn't seem to be an accurate marker for tracking zonulin or for leaky gut. So if you are eating more healthy foods, more broccoli, cauliflower, avocado, apples, all these things are high FODMAP. And you can easily find, and, and we'll put some links to low FODMAP diets amongst others that guide you in the description of this video and the podcast, but trial three to four weeks in a low FODMAP diet. When it works, it works. And people really notice a resolution in their symptoms as evidenced by this one clinical trial. And the final component for your diet, probably a little bit obvious, but we should point it out, is the consumption of fermented foods. There is a fairly long history where we have observed people consuming fermented foods are healthier. Zoom or forward, modern day, and we're seeing data like this. A clinical trial of 28 subjects. They were given either kefir, a fermented milk, or regular milk. And they found in those consuming kefir, a reduction in the marker of leaky gut, zonulin. Quoting, our study is the first showing that kefir supplementation causes an improvement in serum zonulin levels. And I would argue this same likely holds if we had further data 
for other fermented foods. So sauerkraut, kombucha, kimchi are all things to consider integrating into your diet. And in recap, reduce processed food consumption and correspondingly increase whole food consumption. Reduce the amount of common allergens, at least for a little while, and then you can reintroduce and figure out what, if any, triggers you may have. Reduce consumption of FODMAPs. And again, with this, it's usually anywhere from one to three months, and then people can reintroduce and tolerate FODMAPs without difficulty. And finally, four, make fermented foods a commonplace food stuff that you consume. So that's the dietary piece, and that breaks it down to the four probably most important components. Let's move on to the next aspect of this. The second factor is lifestyle. And I want to just make a quick comment that it's such a slippery slope into supplements, 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 supplements for improving whatever it might be, right? Because it's just a market pressure influence that we have to be aware of. But we can't overlook the fact that exercise has been shown to reduce leaky gut. And the data that we have here are pretty darn compelling. 2021 systematic review appearing in the Journal of Frontiers in Nutrition. 23 studies were summarized and they found that exercise reduced leaky gut. Let me break down a quote. Moderate exercise may preserve the intestinal mucosa. So right there, when the mucosa erodes, that is leaky gut. So that right there is point one. But let's continue. By accelerating gastric emptying and improving intestinal motility, meaning the food moves through your stomach and intestinal tract at the appropriate pace. If things move too fast or too slow, this can contribute to overgrowth and dysbiosis. So probably unironically, when you move, your intestinal contents move also. Continuing with the quote, increasing the abundance and diversity of the gut microbiota. So there's the healthier bacteria. Also increasing butyrate producing bacteria and the synthesis of short chain fatty acids. So you see multiple positive shifts occur, improving leaky gut when you exercise. I think a minimal for most people, not necessarily for leaky gut, but just for general health, two resistance training sessions per week and two endurance or cardiovascular sessions per week as a minimum. If you can do that anywhere from maybe 20 to 40 minutes as a starting point, moderate intensity, that is going to be a great start. Don't forget about how powerful exercise is for improving the health of your gut. Now, in step with this, I guess pun intended, would be stress. Here is what I found to be one of the most compelling studies looking at the correlation between stress and how inflammatory someone's blood was when that LPS, lipopolysaccharide, leaked through and again, contacted the person's blood. Now what you're seeing here, and I'll narrate for those not watching this as a video, you're seeing a few different cytokines, inflammatory mediators, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, interleukin-8. You want lower levels of these. Higher levels means there's heightened inflammation. When these researchers took blood samples from low stress or normal stress people and compared them to highly stressed individuals, and then they exposed the blood to LPS, they found consistently higher levels of inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, in the more stressed individuals. Now, if you are stressed, I don't mean to pile on top of that. The good news here is other data have shown simply taking a walk in nature, it could be a park, it could be a river, it could be a lake, it could be woods, it could be the ocean, any naturescape can reduce levels of stress as verified by functional MRI scans of the brain. So again, I understand the, the weight that stress can pose. If you can just take a walk outside in nature, most days, preferably every day, 
that will start to mitigate this. There's other things you can do also, of course, therapy, meditation, time with friends, hobbies. I think time in nature is one of the simplest because it doesn't cost anything and doesn't require any special training, but just make sure to take a little bit of time to decompress if you're not doing so, because this is another powerful tool to help reduce leaky gut. And then in addition to exercise, to stress mitigation, there's also sleep. Probably not surprising, but poor sleep, whether it be timing, intensity, or duration, does correlate with disruption of the bacteria in the intestinal tract. There's also a bidirectional relationship where when people have irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, gastrointestinal conditions, that does seem to cause poor sleep. So you can intervene in both directions. You can aim to get to bed consistently at the same time, leave yourself enough time for sleep, practice good sleep hygiene. So dimming the lights, relaxing activity before bed, no caffeine too late in the day, usually past 12. And you can also take steps like we've talked about to improve your gut health and that should also help you sleep more soundly. Because again, it is it is bimodal. You may be doing everything right and then going to sleep and saying, I can't sleep. Well, that could be because there's an issue in the gut that has to be remedied, thus allowing you to sleep. So come at it via this dual pronged approach. Go through this four step plan that should improve your gut health, helping with your sleep, and also just tend to basic good sleep hygiene practices. Okay, so point three is a supplement, and I would use this after addressing points one and point two, meaning diet and lifestyle, because that will be sufficient for some, absolutely. But probiotics are a powerful tool, maybe one of the best, if not the best studied tool for improving one's gut health. A 2023 meta-analysis appearing in Frontiers in Immunology summarized 26 randomized control trials and found that probiotics do the following. Decrease direct leakage as measured by LPS or endotoxin. Reduce the corresponding inflammatory cytokines, uh, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6, and also C-reactive protein and reduced blood zonulin. Also, this was another data point that did not find stool zonulin correlated. So blood zonulin accurate, stool zonulin not accurate. And that's what you're seeing in this schematic. They found that two types of probiotics can reduce leaky gut, either blends of bifidobacterium and lactobacillus or soil-based probiotics, which are typically some type of bacillus species, so two different formulas. Because remember, they summarized 26 clinical trials. So these different trials used different products, different dosages, but they summate to all being either soil-based formulas or blends of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And across all these trials, benefit was demonstrated, or at least most of the trials. And again, reduction of inflammation, reduction of leakage, and reduction of the direct measure zonulin indicating leaky gut was improved. The other aspect of probiotics that, especially this year, 2023, was pretty exciting regarding is the ability of probiotics to improve the stress response and to attenuate a overzealousness in the limbic system in the brain, which governs fear, anxiousness, and emotionality. And that's what you're seeing depicted here by this 2023 randomized control trial in the Journal of Psychiatry and Neuroscience. They assessed via functional MRI the impact that probiotic supplementation, as compared to placebo, had on the activation of the hippocampus. The hippocampus is one of a few regions contained in the limbic system. And in conditions of stress and anxiety, the hippocampus can be overactive. So something that helps to decrease or attenuate that hyperreactivity can be very beneficial. And what they found is that the group supplementing with probiotics had a reduction 
of the activation of the hippocampus or a normalization. And this did not occur in the placebo group, leading these researchers to quote as follows, the hippocampus appears hyperactive in patients with depressive symptoms. The hippocampal deactivation over the time in the probiotic group is assumed to reflect the beneficial effect of the probiotics on depression-related cognitive impairments. So just one more reason that stems from the gut all the way up to the brain that probiotics are something to consider after steps one and two, the dietary and lifestyle changes. In terms of a probiotic protocol, this is our evidence-based protocol wherein we looked at a number of trials across different conditions using different formulas to give you this summary of the three different types of probiotics and the corresponding dosages and time intervals. If it's a blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, between one to 10 billion will be sufficient for most. Some studies have used higher, but as this data set is evolving, we're seeing that we don't need a very high dose and something more moderate, one to 10 billion for two to three months is a good target. The other probiotic we covered in the leaky gut meta-analysis was a soil-based probiotic and the range to target here is between two and six billion, again, for two to three months. And then third and finally, Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a healthy fungus at a dose of between 10 and 15 billion per day for two to three months. Regarding time to response, most people will see an improvement inside of a month. And I would encourage you to look and to assess if a therapy, especially a probiotic, is helping you, you will see some movement of the needle within a month. However, other data are showing that you may not see a peak in improvement until two or three months in. So like I've said many times before, your first checkpoint is about at the four week mark. Is this helping? Yes or no? If yes, continue. And then you may see a pinnacling or a peaking of benefit by the second to third month. And then you can work to wean yourself off. And then the final point here, and I look at this as kind of a, a rescue therapy would be doing a gut reset with an elemental diet. Now gut reset is the term that, that I've used. It's not necessarily published. An elemental diet is a pre-digested hypoallergenic meal replacement. And the analogy I use is if you sprained your ankle and you kept running three miles per day, your ankle may never heal. Similar to gut health, if there's inflammation and leakage and you're eating three meals per day, it may be difficult for your gut to fully heal. And this is where using a easy to absorb hypoallergenic and pre-digested formula like an elemental diet may help when other therapies have not. And there's three evidence points here I want to share. I also want to disclose that the elemental diet has not been studied specifically for leaky gut. But there's enough circumstantial and anecdotal evidence that it's become one of the mainstays of what I use clinically. A 2004 clinical trial that found a resolution of SIBO and IBS symptoms when using the elemental diet. A 2007 clinical trial finding that in rheumatoid arthritis, so this inflammatory arthritis that affects the joints and its autoimmune in nature, the elemental diet was as effective as prescription steroids. And then thirdly, a 2018 Cochrane meta-analysis of 27 randomized control trials that found a 64% remission rate in Crohn's disease when using the elemental diet. So I would be remiss if I didn't mention this, even though the research has not yet studied directly the impact on zonulin when we see improvements in IBS, improvements in SIBO, improvements in RA, and improvements in inflammatory bowel disease. I think this is another tool to consider as step four if you haven't yet seen 
the level of results that you would like to. So in recap, diet, reducing your processed food, eating more whole foods, reducing triggers, lowering your FODMAP content, and also making sure, again, to get fermented foods in there. Lifestyle, exercise, and stress management. Third factor, probiotics. And then if you're still in need, you can try a reset with a elemental diet. And if you do this, my observation has been 70-ish percent of individuals will see very clear and long-lasting improvements in their gut health. There are other tools, but I feel these are the most well-studied and the most efficacious. And so this four-step plan is what I would follow if you're trying to improve your gut health really with the most root causative interventions possible. Mm -hmm.